Hello, and welcome to the Albright Scholar for January 2024. My name is John Pankratz. I teach history at Albright, and each month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up on North 13th Street, to look at the work being done by teachers and students, and to think a bit about its impact on all of us. Well, you notice we're on Zoom once again, and that's not because of the rising infection rate particularly, but because January is a very busy time in the Albright school year. It's the interim uh, semester, the period in between the fall and the spring, and it's a chance for people to travel and to dig deeply into their own uh, areas and uh, neighborhoods. So I I'm joined by uh, two friends, uh, who uh, are in two different locations. Uh, Dr. Julia Heberly, professor of psychology, uh, is down in her home, I think, in Maniunk. And Thaisa Charles is on board a ship in the Eastern Atlantic, somewhere between the Canaries and Morocco. And uh, the two of them form a team in uh, what we call the Albright Creative Research Experience. Uh, an acre team. And during our January semesters, uh, we have what we'd call half acres, a chance to pursue a topic in considerable depth uh, for a, a three week period. And I know you've prepared be beforehand, but you're also uh, communicating regularly during, uh, during these uh, days of travel. Uh, Taisha, you've done acres before in other subjects. But uh, uh, tell us about the the appeal of an acre from the student point of view. I think what really drew me to an acre was the idea that it was student-led research. That was actually one of the big things that drew me to Albright originally um, when I was like going through all the Zoom meetings at the time because it was also COVID. Um, and I remember like I heard the first term acre from someone from the ELCDC and I was like, I want to do that. And at that point I had no draw, so any research, I had nothing I really wanted to study, but I just, I love the idea that it was giving students the opportunity to have that first step at research and have that first opportunity to just look into something that you yourself. Oh. Taisha looks a little bit closer often. there. She <laughs> <laughs> comes back. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but as someone that naturally has a lot of questions, I always like like the idea and the opportunity to be able to just research more into one of those. Great, great. Well, I I, I know that our, our current brand uh, emphasizes the Albright Spark experience, and I think you did come to Albright with a number of sparks flashing there. And you're absolutely right that this kind of individual guided research uh, is a chance to really fan that flame uh, and get it blazing. Uh, Julia, what about you from the teacher's point of view? You, you've done acres before, and you're in a field, psychology, where student research is really strongly emphasized. And it really is a, an opportunity for me to sometimes get out of my comfort zone with what mm -hmm. I know the most about. And this is absolutely an example of that. So I'm a child development specialist. That's what I know the most about is the um, zero to roughly six, maybe a little bit of middle childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and I study mostly cognitive development, development of thinking and language acquisition. Those are the two things that I know the most about. So Taisha is a force of nature, in case you couldn't tell. Um, she came to me and we knew each other for other reasons, but not through research. And she came to me and said she wanted to understand more about a really a truly important topic, the intergenerational transmission of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, children who have been abused have a tendency that's documented in the literature to grow up to be uh, uh, abusers themselves. And um, so Taisha was very specifically interested in the short period of time, the interim acre, and because she's going to do that thing called graduate. And this is it. This is our opportunity. And so I kind of um, took that and said, maybe we can't do the serious aspects of, of neglect and abuse um, because they have implications that are far beyond my capabilities. Um, but we could look at something very limited, and that is corporal punishment, which some people might call abuse. 
but that's the interesting question. Um, um, physical punishment, spanking, yep. um, to put it bluntly. And so we, I, I did take the force of nature of Taisha's question and kind of guided a little bit towards something that I thought we could do and that I could educate myself more about in the short period of time that we had to work on it. So it's, for me, acres are sometimes me offering a student an opportunity to learn something that they don't know anything about. They want the research experience and I have something to offer them in terms of my own um, questions. Right. And sometimes it's a student coming to me and saying, I want to do this. And this is clearly a case of me benefiting from Taisha's energy. Excellent. And I, I think that is a point to emphasize that uh, very often students, perhaps in the natural sciences, will come into an area of research that a professor has been guiding for several years. And there have been students who have done pieces of a puzzle, and then the current uh, Acre student adds to that uh, body of research. Uh, and, and it's a collaborative kind of thing. Uh, but sometimes it just comes out of that the student's own imagination, curiosity, need to know. Yeah. Uh, Taisha, what drew, drew you to the topic of, of corporal punishment? So it's actually really interesting. I came up with the idea for this research my freshman year um, when I was in a class with actually Dr. Feigenson taking Psych 100. Okay. And I forgot what topic we were on, um, but it was kind of just the idea of like, the differences between like boys and girls and how they're raised and like it piqued something within me because the same period I was having conversations with my friends um, about kind of what our research is about like would you uh, spank your children and the kind of the answers that I was getting back really drew the question to me of like what is it about the inter intergenerational transmission and really if you were hit would you hit and kind of the difference in that is what drew me to this research and that was like my first year here um, so it took a while to actually get to it, but I really like was drawn to the idea that before we even had children, we already knew what our plans were to be. Yeah, just just imagine if you had kids and they never did anything naughty, and you had been planning to speak spank them, <laughs> might not even have the occasion. This, of course, is a really important topic. Uh, it's a topic with deep religious roots. Uh, if you believe in original sin, as people did in the 16th century, then maybe that sin needed to be suppressed and beaten out of uh, someone. Uh, if, however, you're a follower of the philosopher John Locke, you say, oh, no, children are a bank blank slate. They're not inherently bad or naughty. And if you raise them in gentle, positive ways, uh, then they'll turn out to be a wonderful adult with no corporal punishment whatsoever. And that debate had gone on between Calvinists and Quakers and uh, uh, other religious groups, and then was very much a thing in, in the United States in the 19th century. There was a great debate, should children be spanked or not? Uh, and there were strong uh, points of view on each side. Uh, but I think within families, there's maybe not a philosophical discussion, but there's there are attitudes that are thought and expressed. It's, um, I think, a, a, an interesting thing to reflect on how the process of intergenerational transmission of anything yes. happens. Yes. Um, we have a lot of, we, I mean, I just remember meeting Bruce Auerbach for the first time as a, as a new faculty member and learning about his interest in um, the idea of intergenerational justice of yes, each generation yes. trying to do what's right for the next generation. When you think about the long view, um, totally different topic, but the idea that there might be a process and people have documented this intergenerational transmission of all kinds of things, including spanking. Um, and what Taish and I are doing that's going to be, I hope new and different is that we're trying to catch people once they're away from their parents. So we're going for 18 to 25 year olds away from their parents, but not yet parents themselves. And we think that that's a kind of a sweet spot. It is. Or at least asking the very open question, is there already that agreement, that, that matching of what was done to me was good and it, I will do it to my kids. So it seems like nobody's looked at that yet. They've looked at what children younger who are still in their parents' house are saying, 
mm -hmm. and agreeing mm -hmm. with. Um, and they've looked at people who are currently practicing as parents yep. and asking what happened to them. But we're going for another time frame that I think is super important developmentally. I think so. And and how do we learn things? Is it, is it simply uh, the repetition of something that seems valid that we've in, inherited from our own experience? Or is it a, a question that's up for reflection and, and critical engagement and, and uh, revision? Um, people who are in college often think in ways that are very different from their family of origin. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. some ways we we promote that. Um, but other people intensify their loyalty to some other aspect of their early early training and experience too. How are you going about studying this, uh, Taisha? Are you talking to a lot of people? Um, so our study is a Qualtrics survey. So we're doing it all by kind of like means of like through prolific and just random surveyors to get just the information back. And so it's kind of just a guided survey of about seven different uh, questionnaires that kind of guide us through the idea of were you spanked as a child? Do you think it was justified that you were spanked as a child? What are your just general authoritarian views? What are your attachment views? And kind of just going through this pipeline of questions to get down to the root of, do you think this was right? Did it happen to you? Would you do it? Yeah. And another really uh, interesting part of our survey is we're also just talking about the, the vocabulary used in this entire situation. Because um, the first part of our survey is actually talking about and questioning what is our perceived difference on the terms spanking and hitting? And do we really see that there's a difference when they're used in different situations? So that's also a really important part of our study is figuring out kind of just like this cognitive like difference of spanking, not okay, okay, hitting, not okay, okay. Or beating, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you beat your child? No, no. Oh, do you spank your child? Oh, sure, no. I do. <laughs> Yeah. We really had to work carefully on the language for that study and keep it as simple as possible because it was just an initial, just an initial um, thought based on some research we found that said how you ask the question could matter, mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. as you just said. Yep. Um, so we we know that there are lots of different words for that thing that people call spanking, beating, abusing, hitting whatever. Um, but we tried to keep it simple, just just reflecting on the one, the two that are most likely to be used, hitting and spanking yeah. in 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 measures. And then Taisha, tell us, tell them what the other funny comparison is that we're doing in that study. What are our what are our three levels of the independent variable? So we're actually also looking at it depending on the subject. So if it's an adult, if it's a child, if it's an animal, what are our perceived differences there on, oh, you spanked your child. Oh, you spanked your partner. Oh, you spanked an, a dog. Um, kind of just seeing what are those differences inherently just on who the subject is. Yeah. Okay. And then your your uh, sample is is it uh, completely random? You're sending out a questionnaire, and then people who love to fill out questionnaires are are completing this. But I might want to speak to that a little bit more. But you're focusing break, to an age group, right? Break my break my rule on having Taisha answer first, but um, that's because mm -hmm. I've just gotten through, again, doing something new for me, not so new for Taisha. She knows how to put questions into Qualtrics because she was well-trained by our stats methods people in the department, mm -hmm. um, and I'm relatively new to that. But I also am relatively new to the idea that you might pay people to participate. This is the first for me. And the way we do that is through a company called Prolific that finds the participants for us from their pool. They maintain a very large pool of people who are all kinds of things. And you get to specify, we're specifying parent status and age. Mm -hmm. um, so not parents and 18 to 25 year olds, but I had to learn. Um, and Dr. Seidman, another member of my department was so helpful um, in, in, in steering me through that process. Of, mm -hmm. Don't do this. Don't ask it that way. You must do this. You must do that. And you don't need to spend that much money. So it was a, a, a perfect, perfect setup. And we just got through Doing that, just got our revised ethics um, IRB form sent okay. back that is a good to go. So we are 
going to collect data today or tomorrow. And it'll be just like that. It's kind of amazing for me. Because you're reaching out to the sort of the whole, are you reaching out to the whole world? We did not United specify States? United States only. No, no, we did. We did specify United States only because we, we know that the U.S. differs kind of wildly um, in its views on corporal punishment and spanking from other countries. So we did say that, um, targeting that. Um, so it's not quite the whole world. But it is a it's a pretty broad selection of of people. And according to Dr. Seidman, when you put it out there, it just magically goes like that. So, so all these responses. And I can imagine that. I bet you people have opinions on all of this and of course diverse experiences with it uh as well. Um let me complicate it, and this may not be uh, entailed in your study, but it's certainly something further to talk about. Do you think that there is are geographical differences? Are there cultural differences um, in terms of the practice and the perception and the valuation of corporal punishment? I think there is definitely a very large cultural difference. Um, I know, like, Personally, I'm Caribbean and I know in a Caribbean household, it's like kind of expected. It's like a very normalized thing to hit or spank your children. Um, but I know like I have friends that were like, no, what? Like this is definitely not a thing that would ever happen. Uh, but I think that's also like, the benefit of coming from New York and having a very diverse group of friends and being able to kind of figure this out culturally, how it's so different depending on the household of like what is and is not allowed. Um, so definitely a very large cultural difference. Um, I'm not very aware if that would also go by region, however, um, Dr. Heberly. Um, from what we've read and what we've looked at, um, I think the idea, there's a bunch of different ideas at stake here. One, do parents have the right to hit their kids? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think there's actually a systematic regional differences in that in that question. Um, how often it happens, I didn't I didn't see anything that spoke, you know, of um, rural areas versus urban areas, north versus south, uh, Midwest. I, I didn't see anything consistent there, but um, but certainly the laws are different state by state for, for example, what happens in schools. All right. um, like who else is allowed yeah. to hit mm -hmm. your children? Um, and that one has really, really got wide variability and it's changes every decade. And but the one thing we do know, and it's going to be very interesting to compare because of the age group of people that we're going after, they were born, you know, at a specific time frame. And we can look at national data specifically on the frequency of spanking of people reporting that they spank. So we can compare our sample in an interesting way to are they under-reporting, over-reporting? Are our people quite different um, in any way from the national sample? So there's a lot of kind of hard questions to ask, but subtle questions to ask about that. Um, we're more interested not in a sociological kind of perspective as much as I admire that and respect that, but we're really interested in the mechanism of how does this happen? And our study won't get at the mechanism, but it'll at least tell us if there's that funny time frame where people are more vulnerable to interventions, can benefit more from interventions. Because in case you can't tell, I kind of don't think that spanking is the right way to go with kids. No. <laughs> no. Tisha, I don't know about you, if you have strong feelings about that and what you think about what you'll do with your children. Yeah, like so the reason I actually was interested because I'm very like strongly against spanking or hitting children and so when I was asking my friends about this my first year I was like so shocked by like how many were like of course I'm gonna hit my children I was like what do you mean of course <laughs> and so like I haven't done anything yet <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like it's so interesting and I was like I, I really want to know kind of because like like seeing that pattern is really what was interesting to me and figuring out like really where is it coming at that we're like yep this is totally acceptable and okay and I'm going to do it versus why would I ever do something like this no yeah. I, I remember reading in the Reading Eagle this is way back in the 90s uh they'd done some local survey and they found upwards of 90 percent of Berks Countyans had been spanked and were planning to spank and I found yeah. I found that pretty shocking uh myself um I think I was spanked on two occasions 
uh, growing up. I didn't like it at all. And I don't know whether I resolved not to spank, but I, I certainly never did spank my daughter. Uh, I think I threatened her with a timeout once. And, and that was so uh, shocking to her that I just never needed to do it again. She just behaved herself. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, I think. It There's a great her. deal of variability in, so. in, in the experience of people our age. Um, in terms of what they thought about. The thing that I, I have three children, um, all, all grown up, 26, 28, and 31. And I, as a part of this kind of thinking about this, I asked them all, what do you remember about what we did? Yeah. Because it's very fuzzy in my head. And I'm pretty sure that I can count on one hand, that's little five fingers, mm -hmm the number of times that I did a squat or a spank or a hit, and I would call it hit because the things that I can remember were done the way you're not supposed to do it. Right. In anger, in the moment, in, 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 in the moment and not with any kind of cognition, talking, explaining anything. And they all three told me that they remembered fuzzily that it was a possibility that it could happen. Oh. But none of them remember being spanked deliberately. So I'm pretty sure that that's how it happened with us. But it's interesting to reflect on what we're asking people. We're asking people, what did your parents do to you? And that is the hardest question to ask. Right. They may not give you an, an actual answer or an accurate answer. Because... Yeah, that's always true with survey studies. It's just something you have to accept. Um, but in the end, Taisha, and... don't you think we kind of kept that question simple? Yeah, we went kind of... So part of it, as we talked about the vocabulary, before we introduced that to very specific question of were you hit, we have like a very definite defined statement of in this question that we are asking you, were you physically punished? Here's how we are defining physically punished. And we include that spanking, hitting, like anything of that nature. And the question is also very specific in the nature of between the ages of five and 17. And what was the occurrence? How often was it? Because it's very easy to say yes or no, I was spanked, but it, what really matters as we're talking about is how often was it? Do you really remember it occurring? And if it was a very recurrent issue, then you're gonna have more effects about it. But if it's like, oh, like it might have happened once or twice, that's going to change your perspective. Yeah. 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 Uh, Taisha, as I mentioned, you've you've done acres before. Uh, do you know which one of those is going to turn in to a, a senior honors thesis, if any? Um, I, I don't think any of them will be an honors thesis. I was actually talking about this a few nights ago, but all the research that I've done, I've loved so much. And mm -hmm. to be able to like pick one of them would be really hard. But like, sometimes I go back and I like reflect on them and they're so different. All of the yeah. studies that I've done yeah. are so unrelated. Um, so having to choose one of them would actually be really difficult. Right. It won't be hard to take this to the Berks County Conference, though. We'll have something to say by that time. And that will be so half the fun is in presenting it to other people from a wide, a wide in a wide audience. So Berks County, I think, could be fun with that. And if we depending on what we find and how we can say it, it will certainly be coming to you post graduate, post Albright, going to EPA. Um, or APS as a conference presentation. That's always our goal is at some point to get students out there in the world of presenting their research, not just at Albright, which as much as I love honors, that is still inside of Albright. <laughs> um, but going outside is really is really the way to go to find out. And it's, it's getting great feedback from other professionals and researchers in the field and your peers as well as the, the professors out there in the in the world. I, I think that is a great thing. Uh, Taisha, do you, do you have plans for after you graduate? I know that's always an awkward question to ask uh, seniors, but. Uh, I do. I, I want to go into IO psychology, which is funny because that relates to none of the research that I've done um, particularly, but I want to go into like training and development and employee relations. And that's kind of what I want to work into. So essentially HR. Um, so my plan is grad school, an internship, and then working it for however long. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly this kind of research and this kind of presentation answers a lot of questions that grad schools have of you. 
Are you able to work independently? Are you a critical thinker? Do you have research skills? And yeah, you can say, yes, 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 I do. Uh, so I, yeah, I predict good things for you in, in, in the grad uh, uh, area. Uh, I know there are other people doing acre research in, in psychology, but in sociology and chemistry and biology, in history as well. Uh, and we didn't have everybody on the show today, uh, but I know there's a, a get together on the 17th and we'll all have lunch and uh, hear more of, uh, people will give at least their elevator talk about uh, what they've been finding out this uh, this January. None of us will have enough time to say as much as we want to say. That's of course always not. the case. Hard so this has been a nice luxury. Yeah, a, a, a whole half hour conversation. So I'm glad I'm glad we could include you in uh, in that. Uh, we are just about at the end of our 28 minutes or so. Uh, so I'll I'll thank you for uh, being uh, with us. Let let's wish all of our viewers uh, all the best in the coming year. Uh, it will be a challenging one, uh, I think, and. Uh, I, I thank you both for joining me on the Albright Scholar. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much for having us. Great. We'll see you again in the month of February. Until then, so long. <laughs>